Today's episode is brought to you by Engineering.com, a globally trusted source for engineering content. Check out this and many other exclusive videos for the engineering professional found only on Engineering.com TV today. Welcome to a special end of the line from Rapid 2024 in Los Angeles, California. I've got a special guest here, Glenn Fletcher. It's president of the US. Glenn, uh, it's, this is my op-ed. This is usually where I whine and complain about everything that's wrong with the world. And, and coming from manufacturing, there's always something to complain about there. Sure. Uh, I, I'm gonna postulate something controversial in the, in the additive manufacturing space. Uh, my postulate is, is that compared to other forms of manufacturing, this business has promised a great deal and in many cases has fallen short of delivering on that promise. Not because the technology isn't brilliant, but because making this pay, finding turnkey systems that can be dropped into a production process in which you can hit the green button and just make money, that's been, a, it's been difficult. I mean, what's your opinion? Is that true? Um, as in all things, there is some truth in that, um, but it's not entirely true. Um, I think it's correct to say that there is a very or has been a very steep learning curve with, rega with regards to the uh, introduction and, and full adoption of additive manufacturing. Um, but that's the same with every, every industry. Every industry goes through its development cycle, its development phases. And if you take the metal side, and we're talking about metal machines yeah. here, um, uh, this is still relatively nascent. Uh, polymers is different. Polymers has been around for 30 years. It's been in the... Um, in the rapid prototyping space for all of that time. But it takes time for any technology to really gain the traction that is necessary to turn it from that early adopter phase into a mainstream manufacturing process. And I, Jim, I'm convinced, absolutely, and you know you'd expect me to say this, but I can't, hand on heart, I think we're at an inflection point. Yeah. We've gone through that process. Engineers understand additive manufacturing yeah. now. Engineers have been trained. Young engineers are coming through from universities. It's becoming a second nature. And because of that, there are a lot of very large organizations, both at government level, at um, OEM level, and at uh, all of the uh, high tier levels within industry who've made a bet and a commitment to additive manufacturing and are now turning that into a reality. So it's going from theory into practice. And when it really, when that, um, when that cycle is complete, we're gonna see an extraordinary uptick in this business. I'm absolutely convinced of it. Now, I'm, we, we both have a background in machine tools. And when CNC machine tools first became widespread, when they became programmable rather than the paper tape driven machines yeah, from, yeah. from the 60s at that point, is that there was fear. The job shops thought we're dead because yeah. I'm not General Motors. Yeah. I can't afford to pay a, a tool and die maker to spend six months learning how to, to program G-code, basically. Correct. The machines are too expensive, they're too complex to run essentially down there. This is gonna destroy the, the small job shop. Exactly the opposite happened. Smaller job shops embraced the technology and found they had more capability, can make more money than, than they could but with manual machines. Sure. Will there be a parallel, do you think, here with additive? Uh, I, I think so, and I, I think I have some experience in that. I started my life in the uh, machine tool industry almost 40 years ago, and I remember at that time, I worked for a company called Cincinnati Millicron in the UK. There was a big, big resistance to an automatic tool changer. <laughs> Why do we need an automatic tool changer when we can put a man alongside yeah. the machine? And of course, now you don't see a CNC machine that is supplied to anybody without some form yeah. of automation. Yeah. Yeah. Now whether it's how big is the cassette? Whether it's yeah. a tool yeah. changer or it's a pallet chain. And then, um, you know, some years later, I got into the EDM world and it was the same thing with wire EDM. Why do you need to have this very sophisticated, high cost uh, technology uh, to produce you know, uh, your die sets and things like that, yeah, when, yeah. You know, when you can optical grind them. And all this technology has been around forever, it works yeah. really well, yeah. Yeah, and we've got skilled people, and those skilled people don't want to change. Who optical grinds today? Very, very few organizations. Yeah. And it's going to be the same with additive manufacturing. I, I'm sure of it. it it's always um, a difficult learning curve. It's always a cycle. It's always uh, an overcoming of resistance that... Um, that sort of change um, inertia that you have to overcome. But now, as I say, there's so many very large organizations that have made such very 
very important commitments to this uh, technology that there's no turning back. The space industry couldn't exist in the way that it does without additive manufacturing. Uh, the defense industry is adopting it at a very, very accelerated rate. Medical industry, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you're gonna see it everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, loaded question is that historically, is that one of the things that made engineers different sorts of people was their ability to visualize in their mind, in three dimensions, what renderings and drawings portrayed as two dimensions or as orthographic drawings. Sure. And it's not an easy skill. In many cases, very difficult for even some, even some engineers to actually look at a, a drawing and truly understand exactly what that part looks like, how it fits. Now you can push a button, you can produce a physical sample of an idea that's almost little more than a sketch at this point, put it on your engineering manager's desk and say, we should do this. Mm -hmm. and make that work. And I'm hearing stories of taking models like this into the boardroom and pitching all the way upstairs to, to, to financial people who know nothing about this and say, this, is, this will make money, we should do this. And you can get a green light for something that will be very difficult to sell otherwise. Sure. We've also got an engineer of, a, a new generation of young engineers at least, who um, take some stick for being unable to communicate clearly and effectively mm -hmm. compared to prior generations. And whether well, that's true or not is nothing. I have my opinion about that. Yeah, sure. yeah exactly. You see, is are we gonna reach a world, do you think, where what we think of as an engineer disappears because it's so easy to take what's in your mind and then turn it into a rendering with advanced software. Take that rendering, turn it into a part with advanced additive manufacturing at this point. So do you think 50 years from now, is, it, is engineering gonna be a thing? Well, that is a loaded question, but absolutely for certain. Um, and I think, I don't know whether I can answer that because uh, the more we start to understand the advantages of artificial intelligence and the more that that starts to affect our lives, the more astounded I am with the uh, potential for that kind of technology. And you're absolutely right, you know, in, when I started my career in the machine tool industry, to get from a ideation to a prototype to a scaled product, it took Oh, I was going to say months, it took years in a lot of cases. Now, with this, the sophistication of the software that's available, which is going to be further enhanced with the addition of artificial intelligence, the ability to iterate to perfection on a additive machine brings all of that, what was a protracted time, uh, time scale and condenses it into a period of time which we could never have comprehended previously. Yeah, that's yeah. I just met, I asked about the engineer 50 years from now. Are they going to have as much fun? Are their careers going to be as interesting as our careers have been in this industry? Uh, yeah, I would say so. I would say so. I mean, it's going to be a different kind of fun. But the fun that kids have is a different kind of fun to the, the fun that I had when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's just a natural progression. I think it's just, you know, things change and we all adapt and one day will reflect, I mean, even now I reflect on, you know, I know we were talking earlier and the, the first CNC machine I ever saw, I had a card reader, you know, yeah. uh, and you can't imagine that ever being regarded as sophisticated, but at the time it was really sophisticated. And this today is regarded as sophisticated, but in 50 years time, this will be regarded as, you know, did we really use additive yeah. machines? Did they really look like, no. Things change, things move, yeah. things progress, and we should have an open mind and allow that to happen. Well, that's it for today's episode of End of the Line, brought to you by engineering.com. For our deeper engineering series, visit engineering.com TV for exclusive shows like Manufacturing the Future, Designing the Future, and the Engineering Roundtable, not found on our YouTube channel. The links are in the description below. Thanks for watching.